Namaste, everyone, and uh, really happy to see all of you join us for this. Uh, I guess it's session number 16 or 17 in our ongoing series, Kala Eva Madhyatu. And today we go in another different direction. We had one session on Indian sculpture, and today we go a little deeper into that, focusing on the interplay between. Indian iconography and uh, spirituality, Indian iconography and Bharati Adhyatma, as um, Sneha Ji has so beautifully described in her description. So to do that, uh, and it's all going to be, as always, in the light of Shurab in those writings on Indian art. And uh, just to briefly introduce our speaker for the, this evening, we have Sneha Ji with us, joining us from Mumbai. She's currently working as assistant professor of archaeology at the Center for Extramural Studies, University of Mumbai. And she specializes in ancient and medieval Vaishnavism, ancient Indian art, architecture, um, ancient Indian religious, political, and economic histories. This uh, interesting background that she brings, on one side, her deep interest in Indian art, iconography, archaeology of religion, and um, archaeology and texts, ancient uh, inscriptions, and also the political and economic history of ancient and medieval India. I find that very um, amazing and interesting. She has also actually written a book on ancient Indian economy, uh, which was published earlier this year. And she has uh, given a lot of talks on Indian iconography, on um, archaeology of religion, and also this another specialization that she brings is uh, focusing on Mathura sculpture, Mathura and bridge, you know, uh, the Krishna Bhakti that is there of the Mathura region. So she also conducts heritage walks in Vrindavan bridge region, which um, I'm definitely going to be kind of knocking on her door when I um, get a chance to do that. And she also is associated with Panchajanya Cultural Heritage Initiatives, which is another educational, cultural heritage education forum. So she brings a very interesting background. So um, we look forward to your um, presentation today on fundamentals of Indian iconography and how it interplays with the spiritual uh, approach to sculpture. And just to kind of get started, it's like, you know, the as we were, Satya was playing the prayer, the one sentence of Sri Aurobindo that kept playing in my mind, where he says, gods of Indian sculpture are cosmic beings. They are not a Murtikar's fanciful imagination. So with that, I think we can, you know, it's my pleasure to invite you, Sneha Ji, to take us on this journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Biluji. It's a great uh, privilege to be speaking on such a prestigious platform. And I'm really grateful to you and your whole uh, team for giving me this opportunity to share whatever little I know about iconography and adhyatma. I've used uh, some of the works of Sri Aurobindo and he is an ocean. He is a, he, a seamless ocean. So I am a very ordinary person and I have no right to comment on his writings. In fact, the only thing that I can say about his writings is that they simply inspire. Simply inspire. So uh, I'll be, of course, talking about uh, some of his writings also. So I will start my presentation now. Is the full screen, can the full screen be seen? Okay. So today what I'm going to do is we are going to basically see a very um, kind of a very basic interconnection, interrelationship of iconography, Indian iconography and Adhyatma, which roughly translates to something that is spiritual something that is intuitive so since we have uh, we don't have a, a very uh, a very uh, we have a brief time period to discuss this so i'll be just getting into the basics but sometime later we can always get into the more uh, nuances of the same theme i'll start 
on a slightly light note but that actually has a very you know a, a very significant import now this was a cartoon that i came across sometime uh, in 2019 on facebook and uh, this this particular cartoon has a very kind of a jarring mystic and the error is that they have shown ganesha with a typical Sri Vaishnava Urdhva Pundrama. No problem. Finally, all, uh, go, go, I mean, God is one, the supreme reality is one. That, that's, we, of course, accept that Hinduism also accepts it. But at the same time, every deity has a separate function. Every deity has a separate iconography, which is like his or her identity. So showing Ganesha with a Vaishnava Urdhva Pundrama is not as per the canons of Indian iconography. And it is for this reason that at least if we are showing, if we are, if we are you know, making a picture or, I mean, depicting some kind of a deity, a Hindu deity or a Jain Tirthankar or the Buddha or some Buddhist deity, we must be aware about their iconographical features. So it is for this reason that I have kept this, I have inserted this cartoon here. And as Biluji rightly said, Sri Aurobindo and the ethos of Hinduism, Sanatana Dharma perceives the deities as cosmic beings. So their forms, I mean, when we talk about the iconographical texts, they are based on some sort of God realization. That is what we must keep in mind. Of course, there are cultural factors, there are historical factors. I'm not undermining those. I'm not even negating those. But Sri Aurobindo also, whenever he's talking, whenever he's writing on Indian art, he always talks about God realization. So that is something we must keep in mind. And as we go ahead, uh, we will go a little deeper into it. So there is this quotation from the Ramo Upanishad, and since it's from the Ramo Upanishad, I have, uh, you know, shown here a figure of Rama from Rani Ki Vau, dating to the 11th century CE, and it says that actually the supreme truth is one. It is Chinmaya, it is Nishkala, and it is a Sharirina. It doesn't have a body, it doesn't have any organs, but for the benefit of the Upasakas, the Brahman, the entity of Brahman has been given a form, Rupa Kalpana. It has been assigned, some sort of a form has been conceptualized. Now, even when we talk about the writings of Adi Shankaracharya, we know that Adi Shankaracharya was the one who spoke about Kevala Dvaita, which is to some extent in tune with what the Upanishads say. I'm saying to some extent because other uh, Vedan, schools of Vedanta have also interpreted the Upanishads in other ways. So I'm not saying that what Shankaracharya is saying is the only way of interpreting the Upanishad or for that matter, the whole Prasthana Traya. But, but at one place in the Chandogya Upanishad of Bhashya, Shankara says that even meditating on the Nama of Brahman itself is meditating on Brahman. And he gives the example of a Vishnu image that people worship an image of Vishnu. Just as people worship the image of Vishnu, then think it to be Vishnu himself. This is the translation given by Pandit Ganga Nath Jha. So, Namo Pasva Brahmeti Brahma Buddha Yadha Pratimam Vishnu Buddha Upaste Tadvat. So, actually, the worshipper knows that this is not Vishnu. In fact, the name Vishnu itself means something that is all encompassing. So, something that is all, enc all encompassing cannot be restricted to, one, restricted to a single image. But at the same time, the worshipper sees the essence of Vishnu in that image. Actually, what is it? It, is, it may be a piece of metal, wood or stone or terracotta. But the worshipper considers that image to be that of 
Vishnu and he is worshipping it. He is performing Abhishek, he is offering flowers, he is offering lambs. So this is where the significance of iconography comes that when we have images, they are actually, they are perceived, I won't say they are, they are perceived as the very form of Brahman. That is why, that is the reason why we have Shankaracharya traveling all over the country and reforming the religious practices in many temples. So we are told that even in the Guruvayu temple, they, they perform the rituals the way Adi Shankaracharya had instructed way back in the early 9th century CE. So just a little about the term religion. The word religion actually has various connotations. I'm not getting into that. The Abrahamic religions, that is Judaism, Christianity and Islam, they are monotheistic. And they are against any kind of idolatry. But in Sanadana Dharma or Hinduism, idolatry and the highest philosophical truths go hand in hand because images are considered to be a swarupa of that Brahman. And the worshipper, and generally, if the, an enlightened worshipper knows that this is not Brahman, but at the same time, to reach Brahman, this is one marga. Okay. And in Hinduism, we have this theory of one, many, many, one. So we have one supreme reality, but we perceive it in various forms. And we have various forms, but we say ultimately that all are actually the one supreme reality. So whether it is Shiva, whether it is Vishnu, generally it is said that you should not distinguish between Shiva and Vishnu. You must, I mean, it's not the right thing to say that, you know, Shiva is superior to Vishnu or the other way. I know there are many people who do that today, but that is not the right thing. That increases unnecessary rivalry between the various sects. But anyway, we will see how it is reflected in iconography also. And... When we talk about image worship, or I, I mean, which is an as, which is the fundamental principle behind iconography, we realize that image worship is the worship of the embodied form of the divine, and a murti is perceived not only as the form or swarupa of the divine, but it is considered to be the nivasa, the abode, the residence of the divine, and. Hinduism, the nature of Hinduism, at least since the last 2,200 years, is temple Hinduism. That is what George Michel also says. And when we talk about temple Hinduism, it invariably means image worship. Now, essentially, if you see any religion has three components, philosophy, rituals, and mythology. And if we see iconography, is actually an embodiment of all the three. So there is some sort of a philosophy underlying a certain icon. Then obviously there are rituals. These rituals confirm the social norms. And every icon has a certain myth or a narrative. And it is through these narratives that we pass the thought processes and the material culture to the next generation. And even in the case of rituals, they are a part of the material culture of any given civilization. And iconography as a discipline, as a practice, is very much a part of the material culture of uh, the civilization. But our aim finally should be to transcend this material aspect and reach that supreme being. So from gross, we have to travel to the subtle form of the subtle Brahman. So what basically is an icon? Can any image or any symbol be called an icon? Not really. The term icon is derived from the Greek term icon, which means object of worship. And an icon necessarily means a human form or at least a semi-human form. So 
in the strict sense of the word icon, a shivalinga cannot be considered to be an icon. It is a symbol. See, the term linga itself doesn't just mean the phallus. The term linga means a symbol also. Shankaracharya says in the Panduranga Ashtakam, Parabrahma lingam bhaje pandurangam. Panduranga or Vithala is called the linga, the symbol, the lanchana of Parabrahma. He is Parabrahma. So, according to J.N. Banerjee, I mean, he's given the definition as you can see on the screen and a icon, an icon is necessarily related to rituals and to worship. The rituals which are a part of the whole procedure of worship. And an icon may be in the form of a sculpture, in the form of a mosaic, in the form of a painting. It can be in various mediums. And it is very much something that is venerated, not just venerated, but something that is worshipped. And there are various names for the term icon in Hindu, uh, not just in Hindu traditions, but even in Buddhist and Jaina traditions. And we have names like Aracha, Bera, Vigraha, I'll discuss these. And in fact, the icon becomes the medium between the Bhakta and the Bhagwan, the Bhakta and the Almighty. We'll see how. Now, what is the difference between an image and an icon? So basically, an Im the term for image is Pratima. Uh, as I mean, that word is used in the Pratima Natakam of Bhasa. It is used in the context of the Pratima Ghar or the image house of the Satavahanas. But a Pratima may not necessarily be worshipped. Okay. Now, here we can see an image of Ganga. It's from uh, a temple uh, a temple near the Nandi Hills near Bangalore. So, she, the Ganga here is represented on the Gopuram. So, here she is not to be worshipped. Definitely, she is sacred. She she has certain functions, but here she is not. This image is not to be worshipped. So we can't really say that this is an icon. Then, very intimately associated with the concept of image worship is the concept of darshana. Now, darshana doesn't just mean seeing. It is also experiencing. See, even our philosophy, the term for philosophy in the Indic traditions is not Tattva Jnana. Tattva Jnana is a relatively modern name. We use the term Darshana because these are revealed philosophies. That is the belief that our seers, our philosophers, the Vaidika Rishis, the Upanishadic Rishis, they experienced those philosophies, they, 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 are, they were a product of their realization, their self-realization. Or I won't even bring the term self-realization, but, but realization of some kind of a supreme truth. I'm not using the term God because there are, uh, you know, even the among the Astika Darshanas, there are schools of philosophy, say like Sankhya or Mimamsa, Purva Mimamsa, that is, who do not recognize the concept of Ishwara or God. So I'm not using the term God realization, but some kind of supreme truth has been recognized. And when it comes to Darshana, Professor Diana Ek, who has written a full book on the concept of Darshana, says that India is a visual and visionary culture, one in which the eyes have a prominent role in the apprehension of the sacred. That is why even today, we have these long queues in many of the temples, whether you take the Kamakya temple in Guwahati or whether you take the Vyankatesh, the Tirupati Balaji temple or any temple, even on festival days, if you know, a, a, a simple temple will also have a big, a long queue. Why is it? Because people want to have the darshana of that image. And it may be for various purposes, you know, it could be for some, the fulfillment of some wish or whatever it could be. And just the act of seeing the deity is a fulfilling experience for the devotee. In Marathi, we have this Ganpati Arti, which has been written by Santa Ramdas, where he says that darshana matre mana kamana purti. 
by the by the mere darshan of the lord all my wishes have been fulfilled but this is not where the whole thing ends the devotee also wishes or rather wants that the lord should see him or her the krupa drushti of the lord should fall on the devotee so it is a two way process so when we use the term murti it means an embodiment and it is obviously related to darshan to see something by the physical eyes you need some symbol you need some tangible object before you and professor gb deglu deglur karu is a very senior indologist and he is an expert in the uh, domain of iconography he gives a very beautiful definition of a murti where he says that a murti is the artistic manifestation of the intensity of religiosity and the quest for the ultimate adhyatmika entity so it is not just the physical it is the so the murti is perceived as the adhyatmika entity though it is a tangible form so murti is anything that has a definite shape a body a figure it could be an incarnation and a manifestation so here in the picture you can see an image of parvati from central india dated to the 11th or the 12th century ce so here she is in a way embodying that shakti or in a way this this whole concept of jagan mata but here we see her with four hands with a with wearing beautiful ornaments with a beautiful hair style holding various kinds of ayudhas like a trishula so it is the embodiment form here she is this murti is the embodied form of the jagan mata and rather than likeness we will not say that this is like parvati this is parvati this is a, an image of parvati this is parvati so this is where the difference between murti and pratima an icon and an image comes to the fore then even upanishads like the shvetashvatara or maitreya or aitareya they use the term murti in the sense of an embodiment like they say that the flame is the murti of the fire and as per the shvetashvatara upanishad murti is a manifestation it is a form and actually if we see people say that why are you limiting the almighty we are not limiting that supreme reality it is limitless but our perception we as human beings our perception is limited so that is why we are limiting because we cannot grasp the supreme reality in its fullness because it is infinite it is infinite so because our perception has limitation that is why we have this concept of a tangible representation tangible embodiment of the limitless then we have something like archa a murti is also called an archa what does an archa mean something that is venerated something that is adored a uh, an idol then we also have the term vigraha the term vigraha means something to grasp graha means to grasp something to catch hold of so it stands for a body and according to diana ek vigraha is that form which enables the mind to grasp the nature of god so what we see in the icons is how we are perceiving god how the human mind is perceiving god but it is not imagination it is not imagination it is god realization and any image has both human and superhuman qualities like it will have a face like a human being a hands like a human being but when an image has four hands then the superhuman element is introduced when an image has more than one head then the superhuman element is introduced so it is actually a murti is a combination of both human and superhuman combination now here we can see a vigraha of ganesha so ganesha here has two feet like any of us but he has four hands now actually and he has a head of an elephant and the body of a human being so that is not really i mean that is not possible in reality but this is where the superhuman aspect comes and uh, even shorbindo talks about that and in a way the icons are visible scriptures 
because they tell us about various religious traditions they tell us about philosophy and they tell us about the expansion of a particular sect like in what forms is a certain deity perceived in a given sect or the same deity may be perceived in various contexts in various subsects of the, that particular sect so finally what is iconography iconography is the special branch of knowledge which deals with the study of icons and it includes the actual description of icons so how many hands does a does an icon have how many heads does it have what is a what are the kind of clothes that he that icon is shown wearing what are the ornaments what are the ayudhas that that a particular uh, icon is holding where is its vahana what is its vahana is it shown you know killing a certain rakshas or danava is that icon shown along with his or her consort so all these things are a part of iconography then we come to the term iconology so basically iconology is a scientific study of icons which includes the study of the socio religious factors the actual making of images rituals mythology cultural contexts and literary traditions associated with iconology now today what happens is that many people only focus on the graphy part the logy is forgotten but it's important to also include the aspects of iconology then we have this concept of iconometry or talamana which is the science of proportionate measurements of different parts of the body of the icon or the figure to be represented actually i do want to speak on that but we may be running short of uh, time so i may just skip that section i'll just talk about it in brief basically every image has a certain has to be made with respect to certain measurements so if you're showing shiva and parvati parvati can never be shown taller than shiva and generally we are told it may not always happen but brahma also should never be shown larger than shiva or vishnu the highest dimensions are met meant only for the images of shiva and vishnu so even when they are showing ram lakshman and sita lakshmana will never be taller than ram rama will be taller because he is the focus of that particular you know that uh, particular configuration that uh, uh, that configuration of those images that Particular iconographical depiction. So, and every image has a every category of images has a certain uh, you know a proportion has a certain set of proportions which have been allotted to it, and uh, generally they have to be followed. Then, what are the sources for the study of iconography? So, basically, we have both archaeological and literary sources. So, among the archaeological sources, we have the icons themselves. They are the primary source for the study of iconography they indicate various cultural aspects and the cultural concepts they also talk about they tell us not talk about they tell us how that particular icon is being perceived by the devotee or the creator they tell us about the spirit of devotion because an icon definitely is related to bhakti or the spirit of devotion now here we can see this icon of nataraja nataraja and this is a typical chola nataraja i will not speak about nataraja because um, ananda kumara swami has dealt with this whole image in great detail in his well known essay known as the dance of shiva and i uh, say, uh, you know request all of you to go through that essay and even in the recent times professor sharada shrinivasan has worked extensively on the icons of uh, nataraja but the icon the icons of nataraja combine in themselves science spirituality and art now if you just observe this image you will find a movement i do just observe the image and you will find a certain dynamism you will find a certain movement and you will hardly find a nataraja like this in northern india because this particular image is originating from the dance traditions of southern india to tamil nadu to be precise 
So such icons we see only in southern India and Tamil Nadu specifically. We have Nataraja images elsewhere also. We have dancing Shiva images at uh, at Badami. We have them at Elora, but they are not Nataraja. They are Natasha images. The dance shown is different. Even we have a beautiful image of Natasha Shiva at Elephanta. Unfortunately, it has been it is broken. But we can still make out the dynamism. So. Here, the cultural aspect also comes. So basically, this is the whole, it's a cosmic event that is actually taking place. The whole cosmic event of Shiva's dance is represented in this icon. Even uh, Sri Aurobindo talks about the Nataraja icon. Then this is a Yaksha image from Mathura. So what is it telling us that, you know, this is certainly some kind of a divinity, either a yaksha or at least some prince. He's, he has some prominence. He's wearing beautiful kundalas. He's wearing very, uh, you know, a I mean, heavy jewelry. His drapery can be seen. He has a, uh, you know, a very well uh, uh, executed headgear. And the sheer scale of this image tells us that, yes, this is some kind of a divinity which was worshipped. Then this is an image of Buddha also from Mathura. This is one of the earliest images of the Buddha. And this is found from the place which today is known as Sri Krishna Janmasthana. So here we can, we can immediately make out, even if we don't know that this is the Buddha, we can at least make out one thing. That this is, and he is an ascetic. He is some kind of a tapasvi, some kind of a, uh, you know, a yogi. Because he is sitting in the Padmasana, and why? And he is a divinity also because his his hand, his right hand, is in the Abhaya Mudra. So he is an ascetic, and he is a divinity, and he is a Chakravarti because Buddha is called a Dharma Chakravarti. So when the images of the Buddha were made, especially in the Indic schools, starting with the Madura school of art, they combine in themselves the ideals of a yogi and Chakravarti, and Chakravarti in the sense of Dharma Chakravarti. Buddha has been called a Dharma Chakravarti. And what are the cultural uh, aspects? We can see the two Bodhisattvas behind him. We can understand what kind of jewelry they are wearing. The, their headgear are typical to Mathura. And then, even if you see the drapery of the Buddha Sanghati, it is different from the way we see in Gandhara. It is different from the way we see in the Amaravati school. This sort of an, you know, Ushanisha is there in all Buddha images. But in Gup the Gupta period images, the, the curls can be seen. Whereas in the Kushana period images, we do not have the curls. Then other aspects of material culture, like the Chauris can be seen. So, he's a, so since he is a Chakravarti, these two Bodhisattvas are actually serving him. Then even on coins, we have images of various deities. Like here, if I tell you who these two are, you'll be surprised. This is Vasudeva Krishna and this is Sankarshana Balarama. And on whose coins are they represented? They have been represented on the coins of an Indo-Greek ruler called Agathocles. And these were found at a place called Aikhanum in Afghanistan. And these date to the 2nd century BCE. And Vasudeva Krishna is described as Shankha, uh, Shankha Chakra Dharaha. So here exactly the same depiction you can see. He's shown with a chakra and he's shown with a shankha. Then Balarama, Sankarsana Balarama is called Haladhara, Halayudha. And here you can see him with the hala. So these are the earliest representations of Vasudeva Krishna and Sankarsana. So nowhere in the early art, right till the early medieval period, you don't find Krishna playing the flute. He's always shown as a typical warrior god. Then this is an image of uh, a coin belonging to the Yaudheya Republic or Yaudheya Gana Sangha where we see Skanda Kartikeya being shown. And you can see him with his spear which is known as Shakti and here he is carrying a Kukuta. Even in later iconographic depictions, Kartikeya is shown in the same way. And this is an image of a coin of the Kushana ruler Vima Karfesis where this is supposed to be an image of Shiva. 
Shiva with Nandi. But recently I read an article um, by a, a well-known Indo German Indologist called Harry Falk. And he says that this is not Shiva. This is actually in uh, Agni. And uh, the, the bull behind that figure is actually not a bull, but a cow. But see, the thing is that generally cows are not shown as Vahanas, generally. And the uh, hump is quite prominent, indicating that this is a male cow or a bull. And, you know, he's shown with a trident and sometimes a deer is shown. So the iconography matches more with the iconography of Shiva. But I'm not, I'm not uh, negating or refuting what Professor Falk has said. We, the, the I mean, it also can be considered. Now, this is a coin of Chandragupta the second Vikramaditya. Uh, yes. Sehaji, just to interrupt, can we go back one slide? I don't yes. want to miss. So yes. So yeah. if this is Shiva and Nandi, what's the other one? The one, it's the other Shiva? side of the coin. This yeah. one? This yeah. is Vima Kar Oh, sorry. This is the king himself, Vima Karafesis. Okay. okay. So generally on ancient coins, on one side, we would have the king the who has issued the coin. And on the other side, we would have a deity. Generally, the tutelary deity or divinity of that king. So, actually, uh, Bhima Kadfisa declares himself to be a Mahishwara. Now, Mahishwara was initially interpreted as a devotee of Maheshwara. But Harry Fox says that Maheshwara, Mahishwara here actually means that he is just proclaiming that he is the lord of the earth or he is the lord of all beings. Who? Bhima Kadfisa. So, uh, and on the coins of the Kushana rulers, whether it is Kanishka, I mean, Kanishka was Vima Kadfis's son, whether it is Vima Kadfis's or whether it is Vima Kadfis's father, Vima Takshama, or Vima Takshama's father, Kudula Kadfis's, or Kanishka's successor, Huvishka, a number of deities were shown. So, we have the Buddha being shown, we have Shiva being shown. Then we have Greek gods, we have Iranian gods, and on the coins of later Kushana rulers, we even have the depiction of Vasudeva Krishna. And coincidentally, the name of the king who has was issued coins with the image of Vasudeva was also Vasudeva. So this is an image of Chandragupta the second Vikramaditya, the well-known Gupta emperor. And here we can see this is the king and he is killing a, a lion, I mean, he's hunting a lion. And here this is interpreted by Scholars as Simha Vahini Durga. Then image worship is also reflected in various inscriptions. So even Ashoka in one of his inscriptions that Girnara talks about divine forms where he, talk, where he says the Divyani, Rupani, which are interpreted as effigies of gods. Then uh, the Besnagar pillar inscription of the Greek Ambassador Heliodorus speaks about the erection of a Garuda Dvaja. So this is the Garuda Dvaja erected by Heliodorus and he proclaims himself to be a Bhagavata and a great devotee of Deva Deva Vasudeva. And the fact that there is a Garuda Dvaja here indicates that there must have been a Vaishnava shrine and, and here at Besnagar near Vidisha, remains of apsidal Vaishnava shrines have been also discovered. Then we spoke about the Garuda Dvaja. Now you are on the coins of the Gupta ruler. Now this is also a coin of Chandragupta the second Vikramaditya. We find this Garuda Dvaja, but here this is as the royal emblem of the Guptas. But why did the Guptas adopt the Garuda Dvaja as the royal emblem? Because they were Vaishnavas. Chandragupta the second declares himself to be a Parama Bhagavata. So it was a it was an emblem of Vishnu. It was a it was a part of Vishnu's worship, Vasudeva's worship, and by the Gupta period, by the early uh, by the late fourth, early fifth century CE, it also becomes a part of religious insignia. So a religious symbol is also getting the form of a political kind of a symbol. Then we also have references to the images of the Pancha Vrishni Viras in a, an inscription from Mathura. Who are the Pancha Vrishni Viras? Vrishni was the family to which Krishna belonged. Vasudeva Krishna belonged. So the Pancha Vrishni Viras are Vasudeva Sankarshana Pradyumna Sambhai Aniruddha. 
So they are all the signs of the Vrishni Kula. So we have Vasudeva, then we have Balarama, Sankarsana, then Pradyumna and Sambar, the sons of Vasudeva, and Aniruddha is the grandson of Vasudeva. So images of these five divinities were established in a temple, in a stone temple by a lady called Tosha in the first century CE at Mathura. And this is one of the images which was found near the temple site. So this could be any Vrishnivira. I mean, it could be uh, Vasudeva Krishna, it could be Pradyumna, it could be Samba. We are in no position to say, state whose image this is. But here, those Vrishniviras are shown in the form of, I mean, the Vrishni signs are shown in the form of Viras, brave people or valiant heroes. So we get a reference to image worship and the word used is Pratima. Then we have various literary sources also belonging to, you know, I mean, iconometric and non-iconometric sources. So even as far as the iconometric sources are concerned, there are Northern traditions and Southern traditions. I'm skipping this a bit because, you know, we, we don't have that kind of time. Then we have the Agamas. I'll talk about them a little later in the other works. Then there are various theories about the origins. Okay of image worship. So in the regular theories like the Aryans, the so-called Aryans borrowed the practice of image worship from the so-called Dravidians and the, the Hindus or, or the, rather the Brahmins adopted it from the Buddhists. And the third theory is that image worship is a natural and self-emergent form of worship. So of course the first two theories are no longer considered valid. And according to Mahamohapadhyay P.V. Kane, Somewhere, if you see, the Upanishadic philosophy lays an emphasis on non-violence. So even like the Upanishads talk about, you know, visualizing a yajna or the breath itself as yajna rather than the performance of an actual yajna. So we gradually have the decline of the institution of yajnas, though kings, right, till the Gupta period continued to perform Ashwamedha yajnas on a very regular scale. but Yajna is replaced by Poojana and Poojana invariably means image worship. And before the, you know, before image worship as such, we have symbols being worshipped. And even in later Indian schools of art, we have plenty of representations where actual worship of images or symbols is also shown. When bhakti and image worship are closely related because bhakti or devotion is related to a personal god or ishta devata and you somehow establish a personal contact with that ishta devata and that cannot be done with the nirakara nirguna brahman and bhakti, if he sees an all-inclusive path, is meant for everyone. That is, jnana marga may not be meant for everyone. Or yoga marga may not be meant for everyone. So, bhakti being the all-inclusive path, there is this concept of ishta devata. And ishta devata implies some kind of a tangible form and image to which the bhakta can relate to. That is why even in many compositions of the saint, whether it is the Varkari saints of Maharashtra or whether it is, you know, the erotically rich uh, compositions of Andar, the form of the Lord is always emphasized on. So, to, Nyaneshwar talks about Vithala, Tukaram talks about Vithala, Andar talks about Ranganatha. Or Shankaracharya is talking about Kala Bhairava. So, the form of the Lord is very important and we have growth of cults where the element of bhakti was the main guiding principle so this whole bhagavata sampradaya starting from the worship of vasudeva krishna maybe it may even date back to the pre-buddhist times is based on the ekantika bhakti to bhagavan vasudeva krishna where definitely there was an image of the lord which was worshipped so it is called Ekantika or Ekatmika Bhakti. That even the Bhagavata Purana calls 
उद्धव आणि एकांतिक भक्त ऑफ कृष्ण एनिवे सो एकात्मिक भक्ती इन अ वे वॉज वन ऑफ द प्रायमरी फंक्शन ऑफ मूर्तीज देन मूर्तीज हॅव टू बी कंड्युस टू ध्यान योग दॅट इज द रिझन वाय इफ यू इफ यू टेक एनी टेक्स्ट whether it is the vishnu sahasra nama whether it is the devi mahatma whether it is the rama raksha stotra or even whether it is the compositions of saints like medieval saints like goswami tulsidas or advaitins like madhusudan and saraswati they are all talking about the form of the godhead and before any stotra generally the dhyana shloka is given why is it and it is all about the physical attributes of that deity why is it so so that you can con- by initially concentrating on that physical form you can gradually tune yourself to the higher levels of meditation and finally god realization so we have the we have images being made right from the neolithic times your various images being made in the sindhu saraswati civilizations even in the cultures succeeding the sindhu saraswati civilizations we do have images so there are some human images but the bulk of images are animal images and when we come to the vaidika period the vaidika deities have been perceived in some way or the other some form or the other by every rushi now how a particular rushi how a particular seer saw that deity is different and basically if we see nature uh, culture sorry what is culture culture is nothing but the extra somatic means of adaptation to nature so basically man is coming in contact with nature and when he is coming in contact with nature he is understanding the nature of nature that nature is benevolent at the same time it is malevolent and on these perceptions on his experiences the you know in the vedic people they have formed certain perceptions certain images of the natural phenomena where the natural phenomena are venerated so the earth is the is the, the or prithvi is the one who sustains the whole creation she is vasundhara because she is she holds all the resources she is bearing this whole creation then fire agni is important because agni is the source of energy we require fire for cooking then in the by the vedic times metal spell, smelting iron smelting had become very common so we need fire for iron smelting and it is only when we you know make iron objects that you know i mean weapons can be made then horse shoes can be made various objects can be made we need fire for generating heat and light so that is why we have the significance of agni in the vedic religion in the in vaidika dharma which is still very much there in our culture and not getting into this now vedas don't really have image worship but there is a big but here vedic suktas form the basis for puranic narratives and it is on the these puranic it has a purana narrative that the iconographical depictions are based so we have vishnu in the veda rugveda taking three strides is called urukrama and that same the same imagery is reflected in the three vikramas you can see the three vikrama image of vishnu the one of the avatars of vishnu so here also vishnu is taking the three steps uh, vishnu as vaman and then he takes this all all encompassing form then we have the concept of lakshmi gaja lakshmi or shri in the shri sukta and here and she is surrounded by elephant she is sitting on a lotus ex, the ex, same thing you see in the icons this is gaja lakshmi from bharat from the railing of a buddhist stupa not from any uh, vaidika shrine here at the same time this is gaja lakshmi from a pallava period rock cut k from mahabalipuram so basically these two images are i mean they are removed from each other through a period of centuries but at the same time the elephants are very much there lakshmi is associated with lotuses and she is being bathed by elephants through kumbhas here you can see the kumbhas and even here you can see the kumbha so that spirit of indic the indic ethos ethos can be 
seen. Then here is Varuna. Varuna, this is from the Rajarani temple from Bhuvaneshwar, dating, say, to the 10th or the 11th centuries of common era. And here you can see him holding the Pasha. Now, in the Rug Veda, we are told that Varuna had a Pasha and those who will go against his Ritha, the cosmic order, he will bind those in his Pasha and punish them. So that Vedic concept of Ritha and Pasha is now seen, embodied in the image of Varuna as a Dikpala or guardian of a certain direction, the western direction. Then even, even Shiva, Rudra Shiva is described as Kapardin. That is one of the, his names in the Shatarudriya of the Yajur Veda. So that Kapardin, which means the one with a matted hair, that same thing we find as Jatamukuta in the images of Shiva. Isn't it? So anyway, I'm just keeping these few things. So even later texts, like the Brahmanas, Aranyakas and Griha Sutras, they speak about various images in various contexts. Then I spoke about, you know, that gradually images of deities began to acquire super human qualities. Like we have images with more heads, with multiple heads, multiple hands. Shorabindu also talks about that. Ananda Kumaraswami has spoken about that. So here we have a terracotta image of Mahisha Mardini, where she's shown with four hands. And this is one of the early Kushana images from Mathura. And by the time we come to the Shunga Kushana period, that is you know, around the Kushana or the, or the, the Kushana Satavahana period, that is around the first few two or three centuries of the common era, we find that icons are being made in various mediums. Stone, terracotta, wood, and metal. Metal images were few, but stone, terracotta, and wood were commonly used. Then, even by the time we come to the Kushana Zatavana period, the idea of bhakti is well established, and Guna Sankirtana is one of the aspects of bhakti, and even the ultimate aim of bhakti is attainment of moksha. And I've already spoken about an inclusive bhakti as an inclusive path. And meditation on Nirguna Brahma is difficult. So image worship, concentration on a form, on a symbol, is the preliminary stage of sadhana. Even the Narada Bhakti Sutras in a way speak about this. That worshipping an image is one of the ways of bhakti. I mean, they attribute the same to Vyasa. Parasharya. But it is recognized as a valid form of bhakti. And even in the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali mentions that how can you concentrate or by fixing the mind upon any divine form or symbol that appeals to one as good. So it could be an image, it could be some symbol. But even some a very, you know, a very profound kind of a Philosophy like yoga, the yoga darshana is also speaking about focusing your attention at the primary stage on a tangible object. Then we find the Buddha being represented in various uniconic forms and we even find an art, say from Sanchi or uh, Mathura, where we find people actually, you know, in a way, venerating shrines also. Like here you can see that there is no image. But these are definitely shrines and we can see people in the Namaskara Mudra. And by the time we come to the Kushana Satvana period, we have the construction or ex and or excavation of Buddhist Chaitya Garas. We have Jaina shrines coming up and we also have Hindu temples in their very basic forms also being constructed. And one of the main I mean, major reasons for this gradual emergence of places of worship was that they were supported also by the ruling classes. Then here, as you can see, on the coin of Kanishka, we find a depiction of Buddha. This is one of the earliest depictions of Buddha in the human form because Prior to the first century CE, the Buddha was never depicted in human form. There are reasons for that. But I am not getting into those. Maybe we can take that up in the question-answer session. 
then even in various i mean pieces of writing pieces of literature we have references to images so we have panini in his ashtadhyayi mentioning the representation of various popular deities patanjali is talking about icons of shiva skanda and vishakha patanjali also talks about the temples of keshava ram rama yore dalarama and dhanapati that is kubera kautilya is speaking about where images of various de deities like vaijayanta that is indra then vaishravana that is kubera megasthenes refers to an image of heracles which is usually interpreted as an image of uh, vasudeva krishna then this mother goddesses have been represented since at least the 4th century bc so this is a mauryan period terracotta image of uh, supposed to be that of a mother goddess from the mauryan period from mathura then here we can see people worshiping a stupa so here some people interpret this image this is from sanchi as the nirvana of buddha but it is not nirvana of the buddha because actually we see people are celebrating here there is some kind of a celebration music and all so this might be some festival related to the stupa but the stupa stands for the buddha then this is an image of a yakshi so yaksha yakshis were depicted in human form though they are called demi gods or demi goddesses and in fact they were worshiped as symbols of fecundity and symbols of prosperity and the the images of gods were actually based on the images of yakshas then by the time we come to the gupta period we have the emerge you know the gradual popularizing of puranic literature actually puranas i mean the term purana is mentioned first in the atharva veda but purana as a genre of literature start getting uh, start gaining popularity by the gupta period and various forms of divinities like the incarnations of vishnu for the for example their forms are being represented because by this time we have the concept of avatara was a gaining importance so we have like here we can see a, an icon of nruvaraha or varaha I'm skipping this. We have because then where there are various kinds of images. So we have chala and achala. Chala images are movable images. Achala images are images which cannot be moved. So generally, the images in the garbha gruha are achala images. Then we have chala chala, which are images which are movable and immovable. And I think the best example is that of the vigrahas of Jagannatha, Balabhadra, and Subhadra at. puri so the same vigrahas are taken out in the ratha yatra then we have apurana and purana images so basically here this is an image of sadashiva where only three sadashiva sadashiva image has five faces but here only three faces are shown and the other two faces are implied this is actually the sakala nishkala form of shiva or sadashiva or maha sadashiva which is actually the pen ultimate uh, the ultimate principle in the pashupata philosophy then we have shanta and ashanta images so basically the anugraha murtis of shiva vishnu or the yoga murtis are shanta images and ashanta images are the samhara murtis of shiva or you know the image of nrsimha vidarana nrsimha or mahishasura mardini so this is mahishasura an image of mahishasura mardini and this is the kalantaka murti of uh, shiva in fact even aurobindo speaks about the kalantaka murtis and uh, where you know shiva is actually attacking kala or yama and this is vidarana narasimha from uh, the hoysaishwar temple at uh, halebiru then images are classified as adrushya <clears throat> and drushya drushya are of course images uh, i mean which can be <clears throat> seen but adrushya are something like a shiva linga or shala grama where the presence of their deity is implied so when we take a shala grama we understand that this is a symbol of vishnu though vishnu is not represented in an iconic form and even in a way even adi shankara acharya is talking about this shala grama in fact he talks about it two times in his brahma brahma sutra bhashya he is talking in terms of brahman actually then drushya images are of course those which have a human form and drushya drushya are those which are both manifest and unmanifest in the sense that we have a shiva linga and on the shiva linga we have the face of shiva here as you can see this is a typical gupta period mukha linga 
currently in the collection of the Allahabad Museum. <laughs> then we have uniconic representations of the Buddha in the early art. So here, as you can see, here you can see the Bodhi tree, but your people are not worshipping the Bodhi tree as the Bodhi tree, but they are actually worshipping the Buddha. So they did so in early art, when they had to show the Sambodhi of the Buddha, they showed it through the medium of the Bodhi tree and see there, there is a Chhatra over the tree. What is it indicating? It indicates the Chakravartitva of Buddha and a parasaur, a Chhatra was one of the, was a part of the insignia of a king or a universal sovereign who is called a Chakravartin. Then here we have a pillar with the Dharma Chakra. So this is from Bodhagaya and this indicates the Dharma Chakra Pravartana, the first sermon given by the Buddha. Then this can be a, a Buddhist example of Drisha Drisha where we have the stupa. Okay, this is from Ajanta, Vakat, from one of the Vakataka period Chaityagaras. And the stupa has an image of the Buddha. So the old uniconic form is also preserved and the iconic form is also there. So, you know, we never discard the old. We seek a combination, an amalgam of the old and the new. So the Buddha here is in his uniconic form and also in his iconic form. Then one of the major, and this I will speak about, uh, classifications of murtis is the following. So first we have yoga murtis, which help a person to concentrate and meditate. So basically the murtis which are in jhana mudra. So here we can see an image of Vishnu, Yoga Vishnu. And we can see that he is in a Dhyana Mudra here. And even the image of Vithana at Pandharpur is supposed to be a, a Yoga Murti. Or we have even the Yoga Murtis of Shiva. You know, Shiva is Yogeshwar or um, Yoga Dakshana Murti. And then we have Bhoga Murtis. Bhoga Murtis are Murtis which you worship for some desire, some wish to be, some material wish to be fulfilled. Like wealth, progeny, whatever. So, you know, the images of Venkateshwar or Balaji at Tirupati, Gurvayur Appan at Gurvayur, they are, they are supposed to, to be Bhoga Murtis. And that is one reason why we have so many people uh, thronging to Tirupati. We don't have those many people coming to Pandarpur. This was an observation made by Professor G.B. Deglurkar. Then we have Veera Murtis, basically, you know, images of Durga or Hanuman. You know, these are to be worshipped if you want some kind of a victory in a war. Then we have Abhicharika Murtis. These are just made for purposes for of black magic and things like that. And after the purpose is over, they are immersed into the water. Then even, you know, the iconography will, as we said, will depend upon the purpose of the image. So a yoga murti will not be shown with an Abhaya or Varada Mudra. That is why images of Jaina Tirthankaras are always shown in Dhyan or Kayota Sarga Mudra. So this is a Jaina Tirthankara image from Mathura and he's shown here in a Dhyana Mudra. But why are they not shown with Varada or Kayota, uh, Varada or Abhaya Mudra? Because they are not gods. They are not deities. They are great men. They have noble characters and they, ha they have to be emulated. They are role models. They are not deities. Then I'll just take a few examples and uh, um, I'll just need a few, some more time. We have the Vishwarupa image of Vishnu and I have taken this example because Sri Aurobindo in his well-known work, Essays on the Gita, has written two essays on the Vishwarupa Murti. So we have the origin of the Vishwarupa Murti in the Vamana Trivikrama image, which we have already seen, and also in the Purusha of the Purusha Sukta, in the 10th Mandala of the Rukveda, which is talking about the all-pervading primeval Purusha or being. And it is in the 11th Adhyaya of the Bhagavad Gita that we find this whole description of the Vishwarupa. And when Arjuna sees the Vishwarupa of Lord Vasudeva Krishna, it is that universal form constitute, which constituted many beings like the Tervadityas, eight Vasus, eleven Rudras, the two Ashwins, as well as the seven groups of the Maruts. And Arjuna is overwrought. That is what even Sri Aurobindo says, that he was scared, he had fear. When he see this, if when he when he saw this, when he you know with withheld when when he beheld this image of 
uh, Vishnu, this universal form of Vasudeva Krishna, with his, you know, body decked up with ornaments, with garlands of flowers, holding a number of weapons, and the form of the Lord is described as he was bearing the chakra and the gada, he was wearing a kirita, and he had infinite number of faces, eyes, arms, and bellies. And they are repeatedly spoken about in this adhyaya, which talks about the all-consuming, terrifying form of the Lord. Shankaracharya in his uh, Bhashya on the Gita is also speaking about this form. And in the opinion of scholars like N.P. Doshi, this Vishwarupa image is, a, is an elaborated form of the Vaikuntha image. I don't have the time to speak about the Vaikuntha image some other time. And maybe I will not get into the details, but Vaikuntha image is where, you know, there is the main face, it's a four-faced figure, where the main face is that of Vasudeva. There is a lion face, which is that of Sankarshana. Some people interpret it as that of Narasimha. Then there is a face of Varaha, which is some people interpret as the Varaha incarnation of Vishnu, whereas some scholars say that, no, it is Pradyumna. And there is one face, which is called the Kapila face, face which is interpreted as Anirudha. So basically, this is to do with the Vyuha doctrine of the Pancharatra school of Vaishnavism, which has its origin in the Virapura, which we spoke about. Now, most of the Vishwarupa images of Vasudeva Krishna are based on the description in the Bhagavad Gita because they match. We have descriptions of this image even in the Agni Purana, but they are much later than the Bhagavad Gita. Now, this is a Gupta period. Vishwarupa Vishnu image. And see, this is how actually a Vaikuntha Murti also looks. So we have the face of Vasudeva, then we have Simha or Sankarshana, and this is Pradyumna or Varaha. And we have all kinds of beings here. We have Nagas, we have Devas, and unfortunately this image is broken, but we can imagine how large the Prabha Mandala must have been. Then similarly, this is the Rudra aspect. The Gita also talks about the Rudra aspect of the Vishwarupa image. And this is the Rudra aspect from the part of a Vishwarupa image from the Sri Krishna Janmasthana, which was, uh, I mean, belonging to the Gupta period. And there was a temple of Vishnu very much there in the constructed in the Gupta period. Then this image, this part has this particular part of that Vishwarupa image has been found from the Sri Krishna Janmasthana at Mathura. And we can see this is called the Rudra Pankhi. And we can see the fierce form, the jatas and all. The third eye. The third eye is also very prominent. Then Sri Aurobindo has written in detail about the Vishwarupa Murti. And in fact, he says that it is the vision of the one and the many, the many in the one and all in the one. It is the all-encompassing image. And actually, it is where the soul actually can come at unity with the Godhead in this vision. And as I said, as Sri Aurobindo says, Arjuna has not reached that stage because he is, he, he feels a sense of fear when he sees that, when he beholds that image. That is why Arjuna tells Krishna that, please, O Lord, come back to your form of the four-armed son of Vasudeva. Because even Arjuna, though he was much better than our, us, our Lord, he was still, you know, not a realized soul. He becomes one at the end of the Gita. And it is, as Sri Aurobindo says, it is the immeasurable, without end or middle or beginning, is he in whom all things begin and exist and end. This is, in fact, even uh, spoken by the Upanishads, that human beings are born out of Brahman, they live by Brahman, and finally at the end, they merge into Brahman. So, even if you see the Lingod Bhava Murti of Shiva, it's basically that the Linga has that fire, that Linga has no end. It doesn't have a beginning, it doesn't have an end. So, in a way, it is also showing the all-encompassing nature of Shiva. No end, no middle, no beginning. And Sri Aurobindo says, what is the Vishwamurti, Vishwarupa conveying? The real divine creation is, is eternal. 
It is the infinite manifested sempiternally in finite things the spirit who conceals and reveals himself forever in his innumerable infinity of souls and in the wonder of their actions and the, in the beauty of their forms. So there is one supreme deity, but he has many forms and many forms are actually that of the one supreme reality. I was going to speak on this, but I'm skipping. I'm just now going. So just a brief note on the syncretic icon. Basically, syncretic icons are where two deities or more than two deities are merged in one image. So this is an image of Hari Hara. Hari, that is Vishnu and Hara, that is Shiva. And this was mainly done to <clears throat> mitigate the differences between the Shaivas and the Vaishnavas. And Hari Hara Aikya is propounded by many branches of Hinduism as well. And uh, in, in pa, even like there are sculptures where we find Brahma, Surya, Vishnu and Shiva being shown in one image. Then even in many of the Palapirat images from Eastern India, we have a combination, you know, of say Brahma and Vishnu or Brahma and Shiva, Vishnu or even Surya is there. Then there are also combinations of Hindu deities and Buddhist deities, including Avalokiteshwar. So this is an image of Harihara from Badami. This is a, from Odisha. So anyway, I'm just uh, going a little ahead. Then we also have figures like Ardha Narishwara, which are actually the embodiment of the Purusha Prakruti principles of Sankhya Darshana. It also indicates the gender neutral form of the supreme reality. That the supreme reality doesn't have a gender. It is also coming together of the male and female principles for creation. It is a kind of a non-duality and we have <clears throat> certain images. Like this is the Ar Ar Ardhana Arishwara image from Elephanta where we can see Parvati and Shiva integrated into one image. Then this is Vasudeva Kamalaja where we have a combination of Lakshmi and Vishnu in one image. And these images were more common in ne uh, Kashmir and Nepal. Then we also have figures which show Radha and Krishna together. I'm just skipping them, getting into, going to Avadhyatma form. So, Sri Aurobindo clearly states that whether it is art, whether it is iconography, whether it is philosophy, all these things are actually related. Art, literature, philosophy, religion, all these are actually interrelated, connected, and they are the formative ideas behind the foundation of Indian culture. I think there are very few people like Sri Aurobindo who have understood the true ethos of Indian culture. And one reason why we must study the writings of Sri Aurobindo on iconography or art in general, or I'll say the writings of Sister Nivedita, the reason is that these were people who had realized what they were writing. They, these were people who had experienced God realization, they had experienced self-realization. They were not you know, taking matter from the writings of others and passing it as their own. They were writing out of their own God realization, God vision. So Sri Aurobindo greatly stresses on the intuitive nature of Indian art. That's what we said in the beginning, that Murti leads to Adhyatma. It is the Adhyatmika aspect. So Indian art, what Sri Aurobindo constantly stresses, emphasizes on is that Indian art, Indian sculpture is basically intuitive. The spirit plays an important role. In fact, that is integral. It is to disclose something of the self, the infinite, the divine, to the regard of the soul, the self through its expressions, the infinite through its living finite symbols, the divine through his powers. So the images, the murtis become the, the living finite symbols of the infinite. And Sri Aurobindo says that don't go by the physical form. In Indian art, in Indian iconography, it is the spirit 
that is central it is the spirit that carries the form it is not the form that carries the spirit that this is where india indian art and western art greatly differ so indian art firmly fundamentally represents the spirit carrying the form and not the other way around what is seminal is the spirit and this is the reason why i mean for the survival of indian religious art through ages i, I know they have i mean temples have been destroyed images have been vandalized but still what has survived of indian art is mainly in the form of say buddhist cave temples hindu cave temples jain cave temples or hindu buddhist jain uh, structural temples images why because one the material reason was that generally stone which was more durable was used for the construction of religious monuments whereas palace residential architecture continued to be built of wood but it was because of the sacredness because finally it is the spirit that is important we have indian in religious art surviving and i mean constantly you know this expression of the infinite the eternal through finite forms which sri aurobindo is talking about and he says that the spirit or rather the physical form was always subordinated to the spirit and it was for this reason that because the spirit was important the indian sculptor the indian artist had the liberty had the freedom to show something that may not be actually present in reality so when an image of the buddha is shown the intention of the artist is not to show the physique of the buddha or the handsomeness of the buddha or to show what dress he is wearing the intention behind that icon is to show the nirvana of the buddha or his sambodhi like this is a figure of the buddha from ajanta representing his nirvana just see his calm there is nothing no pain nothing of that sort he buddha is completely with i mean he is with he is in complete peace with himself this is what is nirvana and in fact after nirvana nothing is remains total extinguishing of whatever is there this is a typical gupta period buddha image this is from the collection of the national museum just see the calmness the tranquility on this face can this be done only if the physical form was integral no this calmness has been achieved because it is the spirit that that inner enlightenment is manifest in this particular image see his eyes they literally look like petals of a lotus see his full lips see the nose they all show the yogi in his final samadhi avastha this is sambodhi this is enlightenment and this is what indian artists could achieve way back in 1500 years ago this is this because they they want to show the spirit of the buddha see the name buddha itself is you know conveys the spirit that he is the enlightened one okay so finally coming to my conclusion the piece of art has to appeal to the antaratma something in you the soul has to be stirred and in and the icon is truly effective if it appeals to the antaratma and <clears throat> finally an image is the medium for the manifestation of divinity because all indian hindu god are cosmic beings and that cosmic aspect has to come through and the human aspects are always subordinate they have to be separate like this is sadashiva now the spirit of sadashiva is to be shown you know that ultimate reality that ultimate peace dukhant the end of all misery has to be shown so see 
the jewelry is optimum the headgear is beautiful but it is not elaborate here you can see the agora face or the bhairava face but the only thing indicating the agora face is the big mustache that's it nothing is no fangs i mean nothing of that is showing later how we see in the hoysara images their fangs are shown and where there is too much of jewelry very elaborate hairstyles and also but there in a way the images lose their essence to be they are good works of art but they remain works of art they no they, they don't do not transcend the physical aspects to a great extent so the physical aspects of an image should never obliterate its spiritual aspect and an icon has to be created in such a way as to invoke a sense of adoration or and veneration in the mind of a worshipper and the purpose of iconography image worship the purpose of icons is not to heighten or intensify sectarianism but to bring about a synthesis that is why we find a number of vaishnava icons in shiva temples if we take the case of the vidya shankar temple in the shringeri matha you will find vaishnava icons like hayagriva now hayagriva that way has no position in advaita smarta tradition but it is there in shri vaishnava considered significant in shri vaishnavism and the madhva sampradaya and as we know udupi which is the center of the madhva sampradaya is located very close to shringeri then we have shaiva icons here we can see tripurantaka or we can see your shiva with parvati your these are not images of brahma these are images of the manasa putras of brahma but they are executed exactly like brahma nowhere can we see such images so we have equal importance being given to brahma also and here we have gajalakshmi the aspect of shakti so all sets are represented even surya is represented chandra is represented so the journey of iconography is from sakara from saguna to nirguna nirguna that is brahma without any attributes professor g b deglurkar has coined the term bimba brahma bimba is a murti which means that it is the final stage of the development of indian iconography there is nothing beyond this bimba is an image which i mean through which one attains the knowledge about brahman and iconography should be used as a method as a means to bring about a synthesis where we realize that the supreme reality is one ekam sa advaita that is what we must realize and to conclude i will conclude with a shloka from the 11th adhyay of the gita where i did swam adi deva purusha purana swam asya vishvasya param nidhanam vetasi vedyam cha param cha dhama tvaya tatam vishvam ananta rupa so the translation is given that the lord is one but he possesses a number of forms and he is the one who pervades the whole universe thank you so much shri krishna arpan thank you thank you sneha ji thank you so much for um historical spiritual religious uh, journey you know bringing in all kinds of insights from various disciplines very interdisciplinary very transdisciplinary rather i should say thank you so much i wonder if kiran ji uh, so this this whole series is actually i forgot to mention is on behalf of uh, shrobindo society renaissance journal and uh, shrobindo integral life center at oro university surat So Kiran Ji is the director of uh, Shrobindo Integral Life Center. So I invite Kiran Ji to. Yes, I think Sneha Ji, with lots of passion, you take us to the journey of iconography, and that is so beautifully done. I feel like that you know they should have continued. Like uh, next session can be given to uh, Sneha Ji because in uh, you know there were so many detailed information as well as you know the insight which you were sharing. was so worth understanding that is so so beautifully you have done and uh, i really love that uh, icon and image the difference between icon when you were talking about parvati that like immediately clicked that what is the beautiful difference between two mm. so 
I would request Beluji that Sneha ji needs to be invited next time because it was quite uh, intense and then we can have, you know, uh, it is not necessary that in one go we finish, we will, you know, have continuation, uh, continuation till you feel that it is justifying the topic. What do you say? Yeah. No, no. In fact, when I spoke with Sneha ji about today's session, I told her that uh, we would need a separate session on like the Shakti icon, yeah. you know, the whole mother thing. As you were talking about that uh, Vasudeva coin, I was very intrigued. My question was, how did from Vasudeva as a Veera and, you know, to the Shri Krishna with flute, how did that transition happen? I mean, there are so many things to explore. Yes, yes. So um, I'm sure others have many questions also. So uh, when we talk, Kiranji, we'll figure out the time mm. schedule and then mm. I'll be in touch, Snehaji, with you again because you really opened up many things. So we want to like to go deeper into some of those things. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Snehaji. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. You. So I think we are a little over the time. So maybe um, I would request others if they have any questions or comments, they can put it in the chat box. We'll keep it. We can keep it open for another five minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, if uh, there are some longer questions, maybe just hold on to them for next session with Sneha ji. So any quick uh, thing, comment or question, we can keep it comment open. Comment is there. There is a beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, amazing lecture and interesting and insightful as Shrima is writing. And so Shreji is saying that thanks Neha for giving an elaborate presentation in a very interesting way. The different icons are awesome. Beautiful, yeah. Sur Surubhi Pandeji is also commenting amazing lecture. Mm. Many congratulations for such an elaborate. Uh, Arka ji is commenting on visualization and imagination. Both are main complementary factors in time of sadhana. I, I, I couldn't touch on those things because uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the limited yeah. time actually. But yeah. I uh, these are very important pointers which uh, are could use. And what he's saying is right that our thoughts make us limited, but in soul or in spirit we are infinite. True, true, true. Yeah. What yeah. yeah. writer talks yeah. about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is <they're>... finite. <laughs> Yeah, R.V. Jairam Ji is talking about the Nataraj Murti, which is supposed to be the tallest and the most beautiful one. So, yeah, um, excellent. So, I think uh, we will be in touch with you soon for um, another session. Maybe we can talk specifically on few, since you brought us already on to the, you know, from the earliest period to the newer uh, Puranic deities. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can take it from there and, you know, um, specifically on certain specific details about what should be there, you know, the iconometry part. I mean, that also I'm very interested. Yeah, I in, skipped you know, that because, so, yeah. 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 Even the icons that are not, I mean, the images that are not meant to be worshipped. I mean, yes. I remember reading about, you know, the size of the face and size of the waist for, uh, you know, the Yakshi images and things like that. So we'll uh, be back in touch with you. And I want to thank everyone for just so patiently being with us and uh, enjoying this journey into Indian art, the wonder that is Indian art with us through this series. So we'll be back again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Namaste. Mm -hmm.